uh, is uh, going beyond the obvious is there a future for concomitant procedures and for uh, which patients uh, these are my disclosures so I want to challenge the title a bit uh, going beyond the obvious this is really beyond the obvious if you bring your car to the shop so would you be happy with this shop would you bring your car back to the shop where you go on March 1 have the oil level test done they tell you to go home again and come back on March 19th to have the uh, air in your tires checked. You have to go back again and come back on April 17th for the emission te test. And they send you back again. You come back on April 26th to get your battery checked. So from March 1 till April 26, it takes you to get everything done. And why does it take so long? Because those are the uh, 18 days for the DRGs for your, uh, for your car shop so they can bill you all the time. So you will not be happy with this car shop. You never bring your car back there. So in my opinion, combining the procedures is the obvious. It's not beyond the obvious. Is there a future? You all know these data. Uh, we all believe in left atrial appendage closure. We all think that there is a future in left atrial appendage closure. That's why we are here. You know the data from uh, Apostolos, and uh, I think there is a future uh, for LAA as a first-line therapy. Therefore, LAA must be offered to every patient in atrial fibrillation, and concomitant procedures are the most patient-friendly way to treat your patient. They're the most efficient way, and they're also safe, and it's the way to treat your patient. So. Combining uh, the procedures is uh, the future for left atrial appendage closure. Uh, think about the car. You don't want to bring it back four times. Frequent combinations are, of course, uh, left atrial appendage occlusion and PCI. We just heard the talk uh, before. It makes sense. And also left atrial appendage closure and PFO uh, closure combined. I will show you why that is. If you do left atrial appendage closure and PCI, this could implicate that you do left atrial appendage closure maybe only if you have to put the stent, if you don't want to put your patient on uh, atrial, uh, on triple therapy. So there, whether you proceed with a concomitant procedure with left atrial appendage closure or not depends on whether you put the stent or not. So this is only possible to deal with it this way if you can do a talk percutaneous left atrial appendage closure. That's actually what we're doing. We start with PCI. Uh, if we do PCI, we look for a PFO. If there is no PFO, we do a fluoroguided transeptal puncture, do an injection from distance to exclude for thrombus. If there is no thrombus, we go ahead with, left, uh, with fluoroguided left atrial appendage closure. The patient will never have to be uh, on triple therapy in his life. Uh, why is there uh, the need to combine PFO closure and LAA closure? I always check if there is a PFO if I do left atrial appendage closure because you can avoid a transeptal puncture. And transeptal puncture comes with a small but comes with some complication rates. It is feasible. We have 96% success uh, if we do left atrial appendage closure through a, a PFO. So I, I suggest that you always use it if it's there. And of course, on your way out, you close it. So this is an example from an ad hoc LAA closure through a PFO. You see the injection from the distance. Then the sheath is advanced uh, and the uh, LAA is closed. Uh, on the way out, the PFO is closed using the exact same sheath um, again. And uh, the position is checked. And here we did electroconversion uh, at the same time uh, for this patient. Of course, it gets uh, uh, more complicated if you combine it with MitraClip or TAVI, because those are typically elderly patients. Uh, but in, these pa in this patient population, I think patient friendliness is even more important. It is logistically more uh, difficult for these patients to come back three or four times to get everything done. They usually have a high bleeding risk, so left atrial appendage closure makes particular sense in these patients, have a high stroke risk and a bad prognosis if they have a stroke or bleeding. Here you see the outcome of TAVI patients if they have atrial 
uh, fibrillation and you can appreciate that one year mortality is significantly higher in TAVI patients if they have atrial fibrillation, whether it's uh, a chronic or a new onset atrial fibrillation. So something needs to be done about this, particularly if these patients bleed afterwards. So this is interesting data from the partner trial uh, put together by Philippe Genereux. You can see uh, the lower two curves. You can see this curve uh, is the one year mortality of patients with no atrial fibrillation and no major bleeding. Then in blue you see no atrial fibrillation and uh, major bleeding, a one year mortality that doubles. If the patient has only atrial fibrillation but no major bleeding, the mortality is even higher. It goes up to 26%. And if these patients in atrial fibrillation who underwent TAVI, if they have bleeding during the first year of follow-up, their mortality goes up to 50%. Every second patient where you do TAVI in atrial fibrillation who has bleeding in his first year after the procedure, every second patient will die. And that's not acceptable. Something needs to be done about this. And uh, it has become a standard in our clinic and also in, in Bern to combine these uh, procedures due to the uh, high risk of bleeding afterwards. And you can see uh, that we don't really know how to treat these TAVI patients in atrial fibrillation. 31% were on dual antiplatelet therapy, 90% were on uh, VKA and 20% uh, were on aspirin and VKA, and 19% uh, uh, on clopidogrel and VKA. So nobody knows what to do with these patients, and the most obvious thing is to uh, close the left atrial appendage. So this is, uh, uh, would be my question. If you combine TAVI and left atrial appendage occlusion, you have to do it with raising hands. Is which procedure do you do first? Do you do first TAVI, or do you do first left atrial appendage closure? Let's uh, let's suggest that we do it at the same sitting, or do you think it doesn't matter? So who is for TAVI first? That's not many, and who would do left atrial appendage closure first and then proceed with TAVI? It's about the same, and uh, the rest probably thinks it doesn't uh, matter. So. Uh, this is a very short video uh, of a case I did together with uh, Bernie when I still was in Bern. Uh, a patient that is 85 years old uh, has some coronary artery disease in a dominant uh, circ, was treated with, uh, with PCI first using uh, a, a very uh, kind of frugal approach to PCI with the svelte stand. For those who know it, it goes through a diagnostic uh, catheter. Uh, so the CERC was treated. This was followed uh, then by TAVI in an awake patient, uh, only local anesthesia. The sheath goes in. You can see that uh, uh, it was a big valve. So this was at the time of uh, Sapien XD, no Sapien 3 at the time. Used the same wire. We introduced the sheath for TAVI for uh, doing the rapid pacing. The ideal wire to do that is the, the Meyer uh, backup wire. You attach uh, part of the, L, uh, of the um, electrodes to the wire. The other part goes to the patient and you see it works uh, very nicely. So using this technique in an awake patient doesn't need a central line. You implant uh, your TAVI after having done PCI and this then uh, again was followed by left atrial appendage closure. Again using the same uh, stiff wire, the, uh, the, the Meyer backup wire for left atrial appendage closure. I think it's the most suited wire because you never have issues uh, for your groin axis. It's so stiff you never will kink a wire. This is a fluoroguided transeptal uh, puncture as all the electrophysiologists do it uh, all the time uh, with staining of the, of the septum and uh, introduction of the 14 French sheath. Uh, since we don't have previous uh, or 13 French at that time, it was not the amulet, it was the ACP. Gives you all the options and uh, deployment of the, uh, of the ACP device at that time. So in this patient, all three procedures 
were done within a, a little bit more than an hour. It was one hour and two minutes. The patient came in in the morning of the, the, morning of the procedure and was able to leave the day after. Uh, and uh, he came back, I think, three weeks after the, after the procedure because of a, a massive bleed, bleeding in his uh, bladder. So imagine what would have happened if he was on uh, triple therapy at the time. So I think he was, uh, he was lucky we did these uh, procedures at the same time. So mitral clip and left atrial appendage closure, it's simple, it's obvious to do it because you're already there. If a patient also typically has high bleeding risk and usually they have very large LAAs, that's I think an advantage of the amulet uh, that we have available right now. I'll skip that in the interest of time. This is a case I did in Zurich to, together with uh, Francesco Maisano. He first did the, uh, the mitral clip. He didn't uh, think uh, at that time uh, to do LAA closure. But the patient after the mitral clip was fine to have uh, bidirectional shunt through the uh, uh, ASD due to his uh, heart failure. So he was brought back for uh, ASD closure of this artificial ASD from the mitral clip sheath. And at the same time, uh, I occluded the left atrial appendage. Um, uh, and this is the LAA closure. Since the patient had recurrent VTs due to his EF of 25%, a uh, ICD was put in at the same sitting. So we had mitral clip, LAA closure, ASD closure, and ICD implantation uh, at the same hospitalization. Any combination is possible. This is a case I did also together with Francesco. Patient had severe mitral regurgitation, and as a bystander, uh, as a bystander, she also had degeneration of her uh, bioprosthetic valve with a valve error of 1.0. So you cannot do mitral clip in these patients without touching the aortic valve. That's too dangerous. So we did the uh, valve in valve first, followed by uh, mitral clipping uh, and uh, LAA closure. Rationale for combining procedures, I already mentioned it. It's patient friendly, it's safe. And we looked at uh, all the, uh, the cases we did. You saw part of those already interestingly from DJ. He got these slides, I don't know from where. Uh, but we also looked at 50 patients that were done with combined interventions, as opposed to 50 patients in AFib that were done uh, with TAVI alone. And what we found is within the first 30 days, there is no safety issue if you combine the two together or, the, or whatever you combine together. There is no safety uh, uh, issue with these patients. You could think they have more renal uh, failure, but that's uh, not the case. You, don't, you combine two procedures, but you don't add the, um, uh, the risks of them. So combining LAO with mitral clip, you use the same transeptal puncture. You replace the mitral clip sheath through the 14 French torque view sheath. Uh, and if you have right heart failure with the right to left shunt, you can close the ASD at the same sitting using a 12 millimeter ASD uh, occluder. And of course, you would not want to replace the 4545 sheath uh, for this. Thank you very much. <laughs>